Okay, so this lecture fits with the one that details Land Use Planning and Approvals Act, how to read it, what it means. Planning schemes are provided for in Looper. So now we're going to kind of change gear and talk about how to read a planning scheme. So I'm going to talk through some terminology, how to work through a development scenario in terms of the questions that you ask yourself. Look at how the schemes are structured and what content is under each part because no matter which scheme you're looking at, to a certain extent Australia-wide but certainly in Tasmania, they're pretty similar and they're going to become more similar under the state planning changes. The differences between use development and the quirks of subdivisions, permitted discretionary prohibited use and then the way that different uses are classified. Here are the terms that we're going to cover. So I'll keep flicking back to this slide, but move on to images to explain each of them. So the first one is Torrens title. This relates to the certificate of title that you're asked to provide when you put in a permit application. So Torrens title refers to the system that we've got now. And so when you're asked to provide a title, you'll see on the right here is an image that I know you can't read, but this is what a current Tasmanian certificate of title will look like. And it says who owns the land as well as any other important information that's there. This is different to the old system that we used to have in Tasmania where you had a system of deeds so deeds are different because a deed is a legal document that transfers the title of a piece of property from one party to, to another. So when I first got to Tasmania a long time ago now, 18 years ago, we bought a place up in Mount Stewart and the deed has our name on it but it also has the name of the person that we bought it from. The title doesn't. So the old system was that the owner of the land had a, had a chain of deeds of who had owned the property before you. So when we're talking about Torrens title, we're talking about that new system where you just have the title with your name on it as the owner and any other relevant information. And we'll go into the information that's on the title in a minute, but that, that's the difference between title and deeds. And it's a, a system of titles that we've got at the moment. So the land titles office has the title register, the plans, the power of attorney register, and it has a register of deeds, but that's separate. So when you hear this term, title, certificate of title, this is the kind of background to it. Okay, so the next thing is, what is a sealed plan? And how is that related to other words that you might hear, like folio plan and folio text? Okay. So this is what a certificate of title looks like. So on the left hand side is what is called the folio text. This is the text that needs to match the plan which is given in the middle image here. So it'll show you the various lots, parcels of land around the plan that's being referred to in the title. And so this is the folio plan and the third page here has information about the, well, it might be about easements, and it depends a little bit on the particular situation. But the important parts that you need to know is, is the folio text, is the text in the certificate of title that relates to the details, and the folio plan is the actual lines mapping indicating the distances that that is on this particular title. So you might also hear the term sealed plan and you probably can't quite see but there's an SP143510, my eyes aren't that good, that's the folio number here and SP re refers to sealed plan. Sealed plan refers to the status of a plan. If a plan has been sealed then it's been properly surveyed tied to a known survey benchmark, it's official, it's lodged, it's complete. So a sealed plan is something that's a, a complete document. The 
this particular plan, uh, a certificate, certificate of title rather, um, on the right hand side it has some information about easements that describes the right of way in the plan. So this is an example that we used in class last year and you can't see but there's a right of way kind of from the middle going through the road at the top. <clears throat> so the words on that third right hand side image uh, describe various notations that in this case relate to a right of way. So it might be something about public reserves, public open space, um, because subdivisions require dealing with public open space. Anyway, I think that's probably what all you need to know to read a certificate of title. And certificate of titles are important because that's what's required to show who owns the land, so who needs to give their consent when you put in a permit application. So th this might seem a little bit like just kind of jumping through hoops, but just ask anybody who's worked on a council desk and they'll tell you about horrendous examples where buildings were built on areas that weren't actually owned by the person who did the development because of a mix-up between the area that's actually marked out in the certificate of title and what was done on the ground. So it all needs to match. The third definition under the certificate of title section is easements, right of way, ROW, and the schedule of easements. So this image on the right here is the third page in the particular certificate of title that we're looking at. So this is the schedule of easements. It's a document that sets out any easements or covenants that affect the title of the property. So this could be about providing space for drainage, a drainage easement, for pipelines, for power supply, for a driveway, a footpath, um, some sort of restrictive covenant. So you might have an agreement that you're not going to build apart, uh, above a certain height. That might have been an agreement with your neighbour as part of them not objecting to what you're, got, what you're proposing to do. It, when that goes on the title, that means when you sell the property, that restriction remains on the title. So that can be really important in terms of, you know, if you're building a house and a second story would potentially block somebody's view then you can agree that on your title there's a restriction on a height that would make it difficult under the current um, title for the, the subsequent owner to do anything that would re remove that view. It might be about fencing. Uh, not all titles have a schedule of easements so some easements are described in the second schedule of the folio text. So back to the first page, you've got um, the owners, then you've got a couple of bits there that are called um, schedules. So some easements are described in that second schedule of the folio text. Um, and some titles unaffected by easements. So this text is just missing because the information isn't there. Okay, the final dot points on here, you should all know what a development application is. Um, development applications is, while it's not kind of technically correct, it's what everybody uses, it's what your hair council plan is using. It is in fact more technically correct to say it's a permit application because if you're applying for change of use to visitor accommodation, for example, you're catching the Airbnb wave, then you're not actually developing the property, you're not changing anything. So it's a permit application for a change of use, you're not developing. Um, subdivisions will get onto, they are slightly different. Um, a rezoning and planning scheme amendment might be necessary if as part of your permit application to develop a property, the current planning scheme doesn't permit you to do what you need to do. So your application might be a much bigger application about changing the planning scheme to allow your development to go through. Um, we'll talk about petitions to amend and adhesions. 
Owner's consent you're already familiar with, so you know that on public land, because we've talked about this with the cable car example, you actually need the owner of the land, whether that's council or state government, to actually put it in writing at the time that you lodge your permit application. With others, you don't need it for lodgement, but it needs to be um, as part of the process you do and need the owner's consent. So this occasionally comes up in terms of perhaps a deceased estate where kids get the property and it's up to both owners of the land, for example, in the case of two children inheriting the land, that any development has both their permission because you can imagine a scenario where they were in dispute and somebody put in a permit application to develop the land without telling their sibling. So in this case, this kind of covers off on that scenario because both owners need to give their consent. Um, public open space and reserve, there's not a lot to say about this, but just in terms of the terminology, um, this comes up when we talk about subdivisions because as part of a subdivision and a part of the kind of what's called upzoning the land, getting extra, making money out of the land, then there's a requirement for a certain amount of either space or cash as part of that. And this, this all comes into the certificate of title and what's required under the Land Use Planning and Approvals Act and the planning scheme. A reserve is generally a term used for state government land, whereas public open space tends to be what councils will call that kind of common area. All right, interim planning schemes, hopefully you're all... This is important. I couldn't get the text to look any clearer. So I'm sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy. I'm going to read it for you now. So is the activity exempted under LUPA? The first few questions are designed to get you to figure out whether you need to even dive into LUPA or not. So is your activity one of those listed in the part A of LUPA that's to do with forestry or dam construction or marine farming and actually LUPA doesn't apply. So is the activity exempted under some other act is the second question here. Is the activity exempt under section 5 general provisions? We'll come to that later. Is the activity exempt under section 6 limited exemptions? Is the activity described under section 9 special provisions? So these five questions are background questions that need to be asked because if you're answering yes to any of these, then you're not going to go any further. But let's just assume that you've answered no to these, in which case it's, it's an application, a permit application that will run through the normal planning, planning uh, scheme process. So the next question is where is the location of the use? What's the applicable zone? What's the use class? What's the status of the use? Do any overlays or codes apply? And does it have a specific area plan? So these are the basic questions that need to be asked for the planner to orient themselves or the surveyor, consultant, planner who's helping a client, developer, prepare an application. This is what you should be getting your head around pretty quickly just to kind of get the feel of the scope of what's being required. Um, so what is missing here is any triggers in the Environmental uh, Management Pollution Control Act, EMPCA. So if the permit application or development application is listed under Schedule 2 of EMPCA, then the EPA needs to get involved um, at a very early stage. So if it's a quarry over a certain size, if it's the whole list of things in Schedule 2 that are triggered. So um, if that's the case, then you just need to be aware of that. And that's why with bigger developments, it's pretty hard to do this on your own. You need an expert planner, a consultant who is able to help you prepare this kind of documentation. Exemptions to LUPA. So exemptions are, I've covered this as part of some of the video talking about LUPA. So section 11 of LUPA talks about 
how forestry, mineral exploration, fishing, marine farming have their own legislation. Section 12 talks about existing use rights. So um, you might, even though what you're doing as an existing use might be triggered in looper, if if you've if you're already doing it, it's already in operation, then just because there's changes to loop, it doesn't mean to say you have to go back to the council and apply for the thing that you're doing. So unless you abandon that use, and there's rules around what abandonment means, so I think it's not operating for two years, and if it's a seasonal operation, it's around... A, a, a cumulative two years over a three-year period, if you abandoned, that's different. But if you're using it and you're continuing to use it, then you have a right to use it. So the bottom half of this part, oh, there's dam works too that's specified in that part A of LUPA about um, what's exempt. So the second part of this, exemptions might not be specified in looper like the ones above, that, but might be specified in another act. So this is where it's a good idea to get expert advice because it depends on the particular context and particular development that you're proposing as to what might be triggered. So for example... Section 67 of the Electricity Supply Industry Act allows an electrical entity to carry out any works prescribed as works of minor environmental impact that would allow for the construction, installation, modification, maintenance, demolition or replacement of electricity infrastructure without requiring a permit under LUPA. So there's some works that are allowed also as part of road works that aren't triggered within EMCA because... You can imagine the situation where a utility provider like a telco electricity supplier had to apply for permits just to go about their business. It would get ridiculous very quickly. Under Part B of the planning scheme, it has a whole lot of administrative things that you will find quite useful in terms of the first assessment, particularly Section 8. So assessment of the application for use or development. We will go over this more down the track because it's important for the planner's report. But in terms of you knowing what information is necessary for an application and having some idea of whether it's prohibited discretionary um, or permitted use, this section is really useful. So section 8.8 .8 that's highlighted here um, I've copied and pasted this screenshot from the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme, but they're all, they're all the same. So this defines when you use discretion in terms of the process for development application. So for example, if you put in an application to build a house and a front fence is part of that application, if you have a fence that's outside the acceptable standard. So for example, 1.8 metres instead of 1.5, that will make the whole development discretionary. But section 8.10.1 makes it clear that the discretion is only relevant to the particular issue. So council has to be really careful here. Council can't refuse the development based on something to do with the house when what's triggering the discretion is the fence. So in this particular case, the house fit the development, the acceptable standard. So any permit conditions need to be about the fence. So council can't refuse the development based on the house, for example, being too high. When it's not too high, it fits the acceptable standard. Councils do occasionally make mistakes, and this is something that you can take to tribunal as an unfair decision. So remember too that Jared's notes in the statutory land use planning manual that he's written for the class, page 28 is a great resource in this respect. So here is a cut and paste of the very bottom part of that. It says, he says, it's important to note that council has the power to impose minor variations to a proposal. So in this case, there would be uh, some conditions around the fence perhaps being lower than what's on the plans. 
However, council has to be care about taking and making such variations. If, for example, a variation resulted in invoking a new discretionary consideration under the planning scheme, that would constitute a substantially different proposal than the one that was required by law to be notified. So counts, what this means is the council can't put in permit conditions things that were not relevant to the discretionary trigger. So they can't say, look, we don't like your house in that blue and white scheme. We'd like it to be pink and purple. That's not allowed and that could be challenged on, uh, in the tribunal. So each case has to be determined on its particular facts, but council needs to be make council needs to be careful to stay within the law in terms of what's triggered the discretionary application because they can't ask for things that are substantially different. So this could be pretty tricky for a planner to do in practice, and there are probably things before them in the plans that they don't personally agree with. Um, you know, it might be something about the environmental performance or the efficiency of a building, but if it meets the acceptable standard, you can't put in the conditions your windows need to be bigger and they need to be double glazed or something like that. It, you just, you're just not allowed to do it. Uh, you might get away with it, but you open counsel up to be, for the case being appealed to the tribunal and that could be a very expensive exercise for counsel. Okay, this is why I keep carrying on about case law and this is where it fits in. So again on page 28 of Jared's manual where it says you need to worry about the unique facts of the particular case of the discretionary application, it has a footnote 27. Uh, you can probably just make the, at this text that footnote 27 says Atticote v Fox um, it's a decision in 1979, I'm assuming V would be Victorian case law, a Victorian ruling, and also a ruling under K. Bala and others versus Hobart City Council, 14 Regent Street in, uh, I can just read this, 2003, Tasman Pat decision number 218. So two pieces of case law there. More recent Tasmanian case law, which no doubt references the older Victorian case law, both are relevant in guiding counsel and guiding a tribunal in this decision about discretionary applications and what's fair and what's not fair, what's an unreasonable and unrelated condition requirement, permit requirement. So if you've been a little bit confused about where case law comes in and what practical difference it makes in terms of council decisions and council process, this is it. This is a, a good example of how the law builds up and directs council in what they can and can't do. So these decisions mean that if somebody does come up with an unreasonable permit condition, that doesn't have to do with the fence, but has to do with them wanting you to paint the front of your house pink, then that's an appealable decision. So I hope that makes sense. So this is really getting into the guts of what we need to talk about with respect to planning schemes. So you want to develop land. So we're talking about something other than just a change of use, which is something like applying for changing your home into visitor accommodation because you want to put it on Airbnb. So you want to develop the land or you want to subdivide the land. So one of the first things that needs to be done is to classify the use. So you need to categorise your development into a use class. simplified the text that you just saw on the previous slide just so it's not so overwhelming and included a picture here for you to look at as I talk. So the planner needs to classify the use. So what you see here is a tourist development on the foreshore of the Gold Coast. So even though there's different bits to this development, 
it would need to be classified in one particular use class around tourist development, major tourism um, assets, something like that. So if there's associated uses, so for example, a caretaker's cabin that might be somebody's permanent residence, which is different to the visitor accommodation and other accommodation provided on site, it's still an associated use and still part of the main use class. And so it's included in that main use class. If there's more than one use, so it's not a different type of accommodation but something else, then you still put it under the class that best fits. And if you don't have a class that fits, you need to shove it in somewhere. So you need to use whichever class is most similar and put it in there. If you have more than one use, but those uses are really different, so on this particular foreshore block of land, you're putting up a cinema and a car park as well as tourist accommodation and they're all quite separate businesses then you're going to need separate development applications different use keep those different uses separate so a particular development application will have a use class so early on you'll establish whether the development is exempt marine farming fishing dam it might be that no permit is required, so you might be putting up a shed, it's under certain dimensions, and this is, this is specified in the planning scheme, you're not required to lodge a permit. Council might want some information about it, so you may well write a letter to council informing them. If council get any inquiries from neighbours saying, hey, you know, I haven't seen any permit application or any advertising around this shed that Emma's building. And councillors say, yes, we know about it. It's She doesn't need to put up put a, uh, in a permit for this because it's only two metres by two metres. Um, so, but you shouldn't actually need any correspondence. If you don't need a permit, you don't need a permit. It might be that you do need a permit, but it's a permitted use. So you fit within the little box that council's designated of things that are permitted so so long as you comply with permitted use or development then council can't say no so they can say yes with conditions so they can say yeah okay you can build that enormous shed in your backyard but you can't build it right on this boundary or I'm sorry I know you like bright pink but it can't be bright pink then you're permitted to do that but there's some conditions around your permit uh, so a lot of the, the applications that you will have been thinking through are discretionary uses so this is where council could actually say no so it's outside the regulations of the planning scheme enough that councils could say no nah, too high too close to the boundary occupies too much of the block blocks this person's sun for like all of july whatever it is that's outside the specifications council can say no or they might say, yeah, okay, but you can't be so close to the boundary and it can't be so tall and you can't block your neighbour's son in that way. Or you could just be proposing something that is flat out prohibited in that zone. So council can't stop you putting in a permit application, but if it's a prohibited use, they need to get back to you very quickly and say, nope, I'm sorry, unless you're going to apply to amend the planning scheme so that it becomes a discretion use, our hands are tied, it's prohibited use, try again. So this is a potential slightly silly example of a prohibited use but one that Dan's quite fond of. So a prohibited use could be setting up a casino in your backyard but based on your current general residential zoning, Dan you can't do that, it's a prohibited use. So you would need to apply to the planning scheme to be amended to allow you to do that. 
in this particular case, you will be successful. Um, but there's all sorts of interesting examples that crop up where there was an example in Olveston in 2016, might have been 15, where council knocked back an adult uh, bookstore in Olveston in a zone where it was permitted. Oh, it, was a, it was a discretionary application. Um, they knocked it back and the proponent who put in the permit application said actually it's not a prohibited use and you can't stop me from doing this on that basis and the proponent won. The council was in error uh, when they said that it was prohibited. It was uh, distasteful to the alderman and they knocked it back but it was allowed under the planning scheme and so they were in the wrong. Section 5 under Part B Administration sets out some general exemptions. So these are actually listed in the planning scheme so you need to go and have a read if you're putting in a permit application because it depends on the actual wording as to whether what you're doing, it might be of a certain size that you do need a permit application even though it's listed there. So a couple of examples here, beekeeping is generally exempt, um, pruning trees to keep them away from electricity, there's some like horrific photo, <laughs> very heavily pruned, pruned tree, it, sounds, it looks like they didn't plant the right kind of species here that would be consistent with being under power lines, but not to worry. Um, so these are listed under Part B Administration General Exemptions. So there's a whole lot there, people doing hairdressing from home, um, yeah, all sorts of things. So these are some of the other things, um, occasional use, uh, you don't need a permit uh, to actually occupy the home, um, there's a general permit under your application for when the home was built or an extension was built and that just continues. Uh, minor telecommunications, again, this goes back to utilities not wanting to apply for planning permission just to go about their business. Uh, roadworks, temporary buildings, port you know, temporary offices, you generally don't need, need a permit, although you do need to look at the words. Uh, if there's an emergency and you need to do some works associated with that, obviously you're not going to call up the planning department in the middle of the night. You just do it. Um, get, we'll get back to strata divisions. Uh, demolition. So if you haven't needed a planning application to build your shed, you don't need a planning application to pull it down. So that's what demolition of exempt buildings means. Uh, signs under a certain size so a common use of this is that people who run a hairdressing business out of their home it's fine for them to put up a sign as long as it doesn't exceed certain dimensions outside to let people know that they're in the right place um, yeah youth and development on a reservational road so these are all things that are specifically listed under this part of the planning scheme that are exempt from needing a planning permit. Um, so strata division, it's probably a little bit complicated to go into here. It actually invokes a different bit of legislation. Um, so yeah, in the interests of not getting too far off track, um, we'll talk about the strata titles process later because it is wrapped up in subdivisions. Section 6 has some limited exemptions, uh, so minor structures and outbuildings. Um, so one that falls out under this currently is that Tolosa Street Dam in Glenorchy and Hobart is being decommissioned. So there's an exemption outside of the planning scheme, you don't need a planning permit for the decommissioning of that dam. So, so long as the works are being conducted within the inundation zone, then there's no permit requirement under LUPA. So 
I guess the message here in all of this complicated detail is that you need to have a look under these general exemptions and limited exemptions to make sure that perhaps you don't need a permit under LUPA or if you know the detail, then maybe you can structure the development in such a way that you don't need a permit. So in the case of the Tolosa Street Dam, the utility doing that work is going to be quite careful that they do keep works within their inundation zone and that they don't need a planning permit. So just by way of an example, this is a screenshot of this Part B Administration Section 6 Limited Exemption 6.4 fences. So this sets out a whole lot of quite measurable um, criteria. So if you don't trigger any of these, then you'll be okay. So for example, um, 641A, so long as it's not in a heritage place or precinct, then you don't require a permit. So if there is heritage considerations, then you're likely going to need to put that, you will need to put that through council because they want to make sure that it's consistent with the feel of the heritage location. So long as you're not removing any threatened vegetation to build your fence, so long as the land is in within 13, 30 metres of a wetland or a watercourse, which riparian vegetation has particular values, um, that, uh, and also just the physical nature of a creek, um, council is going to want to have a look at your fencing proposal so you don't do you're not proposing to do lots of damage um, and so it, it goes on I've just uh, not even screenshotted the whole sentence here because otherwise it makes it a bit unreadable but you get the gist of it so there are conditions around it not being too close too high you know if you want your front fence to be more than two point one metres above natural ground level, then you're going to need a permit. You're going to need to make your case. So I hope that. Okay, uh, special provisions. So this is section nine under part B, and it talks about various. Here's what the Part C special provisions looks like from a screenshot of the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme. So we're down to Part C. Special provisions comes under Section 9. And if you expand that out, here's the second screenshot to the right here, then there are nine subsections under Section 9 special provisions. So any changes to an existing non-conforming use development of existing discretionary uses these basically trigger um, a discretionary application so if we have a look an example of demolition because quite a few of you are probably looking at applications for permits that involve demolitions they're pretty common where somebody's usually wanting it's usually the back of the house somebody's wanting to knock it off and do an extension this is what that section of the text looks like. So subsection 941, unless approved as part of another development or it's prohibited somehow, an application for demolition may be approved at the discretion of the planning authority. So with regard to the purpose of the zone, whether there's any local area objectives or something else about the zone that is inconsistent with your demolition, that it's consistent with the purpose of the code and that it's consistent with the purpose of any specific area plan if one applies. So if you're applying to demolish something, you're in the discretionary area of the permit application process. The next part under the interim planning schemes are Part D zones. So there are a whole bunch of standard zones and each level, level, local government area has particular purpose zones. But, so this is the work that council has coming up in terms of the statewide planning changes is to make sure that anything in their local 
area has been translated into this new system. So while the state planning provisions will kind of dictate what goes on, there's a lot of scope for local government to define particular purposes and to tweak things at a local scale. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. It's really important that each zone is mapped. So spatially defined using a map and that's where list, the list comes in, Land Systems Information Tasmania. Each zone has all of these different provisions. So there needs to be a purpose, there needs to be objectives, character statements, a use table, there's standards, we'll get onto this. Standards for building and works and for subdivision. So not everything applies in every zone. So in a um, recreational use zone, obviously some things are going to be emphasised over others and some things just don't apply. So, but, but this is the format, this is a recipe that has needed to be followed. Um, so... I think that's all I need to say here. So these are the standard zones that are set out in the Tasmanian state planning provisions. So you can see them there. Um, Dan pointed out that 29 is kind of odd because management isn't really a use. So that's probably not particularly well named, but there you go. And particular purpose zones. Uh, for example, the University of Tasmania is a particular purpose zone. It sets out, it's actually quite interesting reading if you like that kind of thing, I guess. Um, you know, that University of Tasmania is very important to Hobart and, you know, the Sandy Bay campuses is important. And it, yeah, it, it, the background reading um, is kind of interesting in, in the objectives of the zone and why we value it as a place of a particular purpose. So that's the zones that we're given to work with. Standards. Uh, these aren't especially easy to read. Um, so the point here is to show you the difference between acceptable solutions and then the performance criteria. So unless you've got something unusual, you're generally trying to stay within the acceptable solutions. So these examples are from two different examples, so don't read down the page. So in the, on the top one there, um, this would be from general, general residential zone. So if there is any office use, because lots of people work from home, then it the hours of operation need to be between 8 and 6. So this is to make sure that there isn't kind of an unreasonable amount of noise before 8 o'clock in the morning, even though you might actually already be working. Um, so if you're proposing to run a hairdressing salon from home, then you really, you can't be taking appointments before 8 o'clock. It's the kind of gist of this. So that's the acceptable solution. What they were trying to do with the planning schemes is kind of code everything but of course that isn't always possible so then you get these performance criteria and this is where the wriggle room comes in so the under the performance criteria if you don't meet the acceptable solution then you move right into the performance criteria and the applicable one here is that the hours of operation must not have an unreasonable impact whatever that is upon the residential amenity through vehicles moving around or noise or some pump going so then it's a discretionary application so council needs to look at what you're proposing and say okay so you're proposing to start your operation at 7 30 is this reasonable given the context um, and as part of a discretionary application that would be advertised the people who might be affected by that have an opportunity to say something. This is the second of those two tables on the slide that we just looked at. So this is about garages or carports. So the standard is that if your garage or carport is set back 
from the primary frontage of the house at least 5.5 meters <clears throat> or from the actually the front boundary that means or one meter behind the facade of the building even if that's closer to the front boundary than five and a half meters then it's acceptable it fits into that acceptable solution so if the garage is the same as the dwelling facade if a portion of the dwelling gross floor area is located above the garage or carport so the house is actually over the top of the garage or carport so it's actually part of the house then it's acceptable you get the gist of it so if it's not so if for example you're in battery point and a lot of the houses are really quite close to the boundary so the the edge of the footpath then it might be just completely impossible for you to meet the acceptable standards and we no longer have a battery point planning scheme it's now part of the Hobart interim planning scheme so in almost all those cases you are under the those performance criteria so p2 here says garage or carport must have a setback from the primary a primary frontage that is compatible with existing garages or carports in the street taking into account any topological constraints so if it's really hilly and it's just completely impractical to do anything other than what you're proposing then council will most likely say fine but because it's not part of the acceptable solution the acceptable standard then it's discretionary council can say no so that's how this works okay part e codes and overlays so they're not actually called overlays in the planning scheme they're called codes but what these do is that they define an area that might be different to the zone so you might have a general residential zone but you might have a code to do with an area of inundation near the water line of the Derwent. You might have a code that deals with um, demarcating the top of a hill. So preferably they're all spatially defined on a map, but it might be defined um, through a definition uh, somehow. So if there's any clash between a code and the provisions in the zone, then the code rules. So this is where people who are worried about heritage values in Battery Point can kind of heave a bit of a sigh of relief because there will be heritage overlays that override the provisions of the general residential zone as set out in the state planning provisions. And as with zones, there's a bit of a recipe here. So a code would normally say what the purpose is, um, how to apply it, any definitions. So this is important. You can't call the same thing dwelling in one place and house in another. It all has to be the same. Um, any exemptions, uh, any application requirements and the standards. So that's where you'll see what the um, acceptable standards are all right we're nearly there so these are the codes so these are you can see here if you just skim down them you have codes about being in a bushfire prone area so that there's definitions about even how close to the bush you need to be before you're in this code um, potentially contaminated land, land slips are really, landslide is a really common one, um, coastal erosion, obviously this is important information over and above the actual zone purpose and zone objectives. So this is something that you need to work through as part of the process of looking as to whether your development application should be approved or not. Part F, specific area plans, we're really almost there. So these are local government defined areas. They have comprehensive specific plans that relate to a particular area. So as with codes, these specific area plans override the provisions of not just the zones, but the codes too. 
So I've copied a section of the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme. So if you expand out Part F specific area plans, you'll see that there are plans for Gregory Street in Sandy Bay for North Hobart and for Wellington Park. And if you go under the Gregory Street plan, then uh, there's a figure towards the bottom of, of that menu and it shows exactly where we mean when we say Gregory Street. And there's some very general text there that has to do with the intentions around it being a plan for this area. Uh, the other one that is relevant that we'll come back to later in semester is that the developer for Glebe Hill Estate, Rob Lynch, is going to come in um, and he is going to talk about his subdivision and that was one of these special areas within the City of Clarence. So it's not part of the general, it's general residential, but it's not actually part of that zone because it has its own specific area plan and so that's what apply here so uh, you could make a case of, you know why shouldn't it have just been dealt with under the zone that's a good question it's something that we could ask Rob when he comes in the last part of the planning schemes is the appendices so this is what you look what it looks like in I plan when you go down to the bottom and the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme, well, actually, they all don't open up to Appendix 1, 2, and 3. So the referenced and incorporated documents are under Appendix 1. Uh, under the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme, there's no incorporated documents. But the reference documents refers to the City of Hobart Significant Tree Register. So this was attached to the planning scheme in on the 14th of June 2012 and so this is a big document that has photographs of the trees um, don't go idly clicking on the PDF that's available for the, on the City of Hobart webpage unless you've got plenty of downloads because it's a pretty big document um, so that's a good example of a ref so the second Appendix is about planning scheme amendments. The planning schemes are new, so you probably won't find anything listed here for your particular interim planning scheme. There's certainly nothing in the Hobart interim planning scheme. Appendix 3 all contain a version of a planning purpose notice that Peter Carl Gutwin, as the Minister for Planning and Local Government, has um, that directs councils to the making of local provisions and that local provisions override the state provisions in circum certain circumstances. So this is something that appears in Appendix 3 of the Interim Planning Schemes. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, congratulations on getting to the end of this. This is the guts of how the planning scheme works. I hope there's information in here that relates to your first assessment that you find helpful. We are fully cognizant that this is not easygoing. This is not something that you gift to people in terms of it being engaging reading. We get that. But it is important in terms of setting out what you can and can't do. And if you're aiming to work in this field, whether it's as a land surveyor, as a consultant planner, as a planner working within council, or simply as an informed member of the public who is having their say about planning reform then you do need to know the detail the, de the devil is in the detail and it matters so I hope this has been helpful